Good afternoon and welcome to the Pantheon Resources PLC Investor Presentation. Throughout the recorded presentation, investors will be in listen-only mode. Questions are encouraged and can be submitted at any time by the Q&A tab. Situated in the right corner of your screen, just simply type in your questions and press send. The company may not be in a position to answer every question received during the meeting itself. However, the company can review all the questions submitted today and publish responses where it's appropriate to do so. Before we begin, I'd like to submit the following poll. I'd now like to hand you over to David Hobbs. Good afternoon to you, sir. Thank you very much indeed, Alessandro. Uh, good afternoon to everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, we're going to be updating you today on uh, progress since our last update um, and uh, talking about upcoming activity. Uh, we'll be reiterating why we're pursuing the, uh, the strategy that we laid out um, just over a year ago, uh, continue to work on that with a single-minded focus on turning our assets to cash flow uh, and we'll be describing two initiatives that provide exposure to optimization of that strategy. Uh, uh, first, uh, the drilling of the Megrez One well to uh, appraise the eastern top sets of Apun, and second, moving uh, the gas sale forward. However, as we'll explain, these are options that give us a chance to retain more of the value for shareholders rather than being the only path forward. We're going to lay out a conservative view of the timeline to get to first oil production. And I know that uh, there are a lot of participants who are interested in the technical uh, underpinning of both the Megros one and the reservoir quality question overall. Um, and we've arranged for Roger Young to present his work and address any questions that you may have uh, in that regard. Uh, I'd ask you to note the disclaimer, but not to spend time on it right now. Um, and just to reiterate uh, that our primary core focus of, uh, for the company is developing the 1.6 plus or minus billion barrels of, of independently verified resource, uh, bringing it to cash flow uh, as quickly as can be achieved as, uh, and in as undiluted a fashion in order to retain as much value for existing shareholders as possible. We've made uh, a lot of progress since we last updated you, including uh, the fundraise to cover the cost of uh, the Megrez One well. Um, the, that pad is under construction. It's more than 50% complete uh, as we sit here today, uh, and preparations are beginning to mobilize the rig in line with the expected timeline. Um, I don't think anyone requires uh, to be reminded that it's uh, bigger than 600 million barrels. Uh, Bob and Jay will talk about that more in due, uh, in, in due course. Uh, we announced earlier this week that we had appointed Philip Patman as uh, our US-based CFO, um, which is part of the continuing consolidation uh, of our activities here into the United States. And we've agreed the appointment of uh, advisors on a success fee basis to move forward with strategic funding and ultimately to an IPO. Uh, and, and we'll talk more about that in due course. The uh, investment case uh, that, that we are laying out uh, and have laid out um, is competing for capital uh, in an environment where the big four basins, those are the basins that are most active in the US lower 48, uh, have been attracting most of the capital. And we need to be competitive with that in order to uh, achieve our strategic goals in terms of raising the funding uh, to develop the Apun field and subsequently out of the cash flows of that, the Kodiak field. Um, we have done a lot of work on benchmarking and engagement with uh, investors, both potential and existing. And what this slide lays out for you is that the investment case is competitive, both against the companies who've been focused in those big four basins and also against uh, half cycle cost of activity in those basins. Our core strategy, as we said, remains uh, developing the resources that we've discovered. And what we've said is that anything we do that appears not to be aligned with that must pass the test. Does it help us to achieve that value faster, at less dilution of value, or at higher value? And the two initiatives that we're going to focus on today uh, are enhancements to that core strategy. The first is drilling the Megrez One well to secure the development timeline for Apun rather than start having a stop go on that development timeline. 
Um, and success in the mega as well will enhance the startup ramp up cash flows because the wells are going to have higher initial production rates um, and therefore reduce the size of the cash sink to get to cash flow self-sufficiency. In terms of the engagement with uh, the Alaska Gas Development Corporation, uh, Gas Line Development Corporation, sorry, um, that is being pursued because it provides us access to non-dilutive funding and therefore re uh, reduces the expected value dilution in our overall financing strategy. Um, and we can, uh, we can address that in more detail in due course. But those two initiatives, if they work, expose us to a higher upside for investors, uh, but our development of the core resource is not influenced in any way. Geologically, there is no um, uh, reason why a result of Megrez would alter the underlying assessment of um, the uh, Apun and Kodiak fields. And in terms of uh, access to funding, there are, we will have to pursue other uh, options in the event that we don't uh, ultimately see the uh, uh, AGDC project move to fruition. Um, so I'm going to hand over to, to Bob and Jay at this point to discuss uh, Megarez, both in terms of the prospect and the activity. Well, thanks, David. <clears throat> so this, this well is really, truly a collaboration between Bob's group and the engineering and the operations group. As David says, we're targeting 609 million barrels over three TCF of gas. Roger will show you and, and Bob will talk about these sands are the eastern top sets east of the Dalton Highway. Our pad is along the Dalton Highway. So we're, we're drilling a directional well. It's a relatively simple well. It's about 10,400 feet measured depth, about 8,400 feet total vertical depth. And the maximum angle is about 50 degrees. And we've worked with Bob's group and with Roger, with SLB, with U.S. Coring, and Bob jump in at any time to ensure that we can get all the data that both we and Bob and his group want to get out of the MEGRA as well, including coring and sidewall cores and e-logs, et cetera. Uh, th thanks, Jay. I was like kind of anxious to, to jump in there and just say, uh, look, I've been in this game for 50 years. This has got to be one of the best prospects I've ever seen. You know, I think the, the team agrees with that. And we're going to discuss it in more detail with Roger in a, in a, in a few moments on wh why we believe that. It's a huge prize and, you know, we're, we're, we will get into the details, but it is, you know, it's a, it is a great prospect, world-class and, you know, we're testing, you know, a, an excellent reservoir here. Again, those details in a few minutes, but, you know, I was just anxious to step in and make that statement to everybody. Yeah. We're going to, we're going to use oil-based mud, which is a little more expensive than water-based, but that reduces the uh, swelling of the clays, which is what has caused us some, some issues in the past uh, and reduces the drag. And we, we just believe that we have a really, really great plan for this well, as we said, taking full cores, sidewall cores, logging while drilling and the e-logs. And as, as, as David said, success for the Eastern top sets yields us uh, less capital per thousand barrels a day of oil flow rate. So that's good for everybody. And also, as David said, more quickly to self-sufficiency on, on cash flow. I'm, I'm confident that there are going to be uh, questions about uh, what constitutes uh, success. Um, before, we, we, before we get on to uh, this slide, which is, which is merely to remind that uh, regardless of the outcome of Megarez, the Arpon and Kodiak developments will proceed. Um, uh, but Bob, do you want to, uh, to talk a little bit about uh, the difference between the threshold and the uh, and and the expectation and what success sure. uh, how we would judge success. Sure, right at the moment, our expectation, our expectation, and again, we'll show you the work that is the foundation for that expectation. Is we're 
we're expecting to see reservoirs between you know 20 to 25 percent porosities five to 35 percent millidarcies and that is significantly better than anything we tested at alkade 2 50 to even 200 times better in terms of the permeability however however we have a good result we have you know good reservoir in the pipeline state well at the western top set hasn't been tested yet in that in that zone the so it, if we could find that kind of quality reservoir that we've already seen in the western top set that would be a good result we're expecting significantly better than that but that in itself would be a good result. Thanks. So the, to summarize, we're not, until until we have drilled the well, until we've got the cores and understand the reservoir, success is gonna be measured in terms of the quality of reservoir we encounter. Uh, the geometry of the well will determine what flow rates one would expect from that geology. Um, and that's the reason that we won't be today sharing uh, target flow rates or anything. But the critical point I just want to bring home is if the uh, uh, mega as well encounters reservoirs that would yield flow rates that are commercial, whether they are as good as our expectation or not, that would constitute a success in the case of mega. Um, moving, moving forward then, as, as we said, um, we, we think it's as good an exploration shot as, as anyone has drilled in a long time. And certainly we think it's the, the best uh, uh, well being drilled this year. Um, but in the event that it doesn't proceed, we think we've got a very attractive core development benchmarked against the competing uses of capital, um, and we will pursue alternative funding pathways uh, in the event that, that Megaris doesn't deliver uh, as expected. Um, in terms of the gas sales initiative, uh, many of you would have seen that uh, AGDC uh, shared the uh, first uh, phase uh, report the draft from uh, Wood Mackenzie. Um, the uh, the overwhelming conclusion of the report uh, was that the pipeline makes sense for its uh, phase one domestic uh, uh, or in-state uh, gas demand um, and uh, secures the optionality for a really much, much better outcome um, in the event that the full project moves forward. Um, and we will be continuing to engage constructively with AGDC on moving this forward. Um, the Again, just to stress, if this project doesn't come to fruition in terms of the gas, our base injection plan, all the metrics that we've, uh, we've shared with people um, are, have been on the basis that we will be uh, re-injecting gas. Initially, that requires one injection well for every three production wells in due course. Uh, you, you begin to reuse old production wells for injection. So I, I just don't want people to, to think there's a one-to-one -one correlation uh, uh, in addition. Uh, we will need to have injection capacity for more than the potential gas uh, sales offtake um, as well. So gas reinjection continues to be the base case uh, that we're assuming, and we will only uh, uh, move to a different plan when that has been secured. Um, in terms of the overall timetable, um, the uh, timeline we've shared um, uh, is assuming that it takes as long as we can imagine for the uh, environmental impact statement. Um, so allowing for uh, a 12 plus months overrun on uh, the expected schedule. The Corps of Engineers has recently uh, adopted regulations requiring it to actually process in 18 months, uh, but we, uh, we don't want to presume that we're going to uh, achieve uh, the fastest EIS that is, has been uh, done. And, and so this is a conservative timeline. You'll see that uh, subject to funding, we have plans for additional appraisal, the, uh, the three wells in Kodiak um, and the further well in the Western top sets, um, the precise timing of those to be confirmed. But what is firm in our planning um, is drilling the Eastern top set with Megrez continuing the development planning and, and regulatory approval work um, uh, with a view to having FID uh, late in 2027 and being able to begin drilling uh, production wells, installing facilities and uh, undertaking the pipeline connection for oil exports. 
In terms of the gas project, as, as you see along the bottom there, that is an optimization project which will add appreciably to the value of the project, will significantly reduce uh, expected dilution, but it's not the base case in terms of, of moving the project forward. Um, at that point, um, I'm, I'm going to pause uh, to address some, some questions. Uh, there will be an opportunity for people to ask uh, questions related to Bob and Roger's more detailed presentation on MEGRES and, and the reservoir quality uh, assessments and, and the work that ESIS has been doing. Um, for the most part, we are going to respond to questions by aggregating them um, and answering them in writing where that is the most efficient way of doing it. Uh, but uh, there, are, there are two or three questions that have uh, been put um, uh, uh, both before and, and during the course of, of this presentation. And so I just want to, to address those first. Um, the one relates to uh, plans for a US listing. And I just want to qu uh, clarify because I know it's a question that a number of investors have been asking over the last several months. Um, You'll, you'll recall that Pantheon first talked about uh, exploring a US listing back in 2020, so it's not a new topic. Uh, but what was clear was that we were at least a year away from being in a position to act on any market window that related to um, a US listing because there's, there's background preparatory work in terms of building the controls and documentation, et cetera, that, that would just be good governance for a company in any case. Um, and certainly uh, that's, that's work that whether we were pursuing a listing or not, um, uh, Pantheon would be undertaking. What we're aiming to do is to get that work done to a point at which we have a between three and six months maximum uh, runway to get to an IPO. We're not going to proceed with an IPO uh, unless there is good reason to believe based on the market testing that it will be enhancing a value for shareholders. There is limited money being committed to that process because the vast majority of the costs of an IPO um, are A, they're back end loaded, um, and B, uh, we are, uh, they're, they're based on success fees. Um, so there has been a minimum level of, of money spent doing work which is predominantly required for the uh, effective management of the business to put ourselves in a position where we have a realistic prospect of an IPO uh, should the market allow it. In terms of what specific form that will take, um, that will be subject to the detailed advice of the investment bankers, of the lawyers, of the uh, accountants who, are, who will be working on uh, the program. So it's not a commitment uh, that we are going to be a foreign issuer on a US exchange or a US issuer on that. That will be a decision that's taken at the time based on the regulations um, and the tax treatment at that time. Similarly, uh, I, I'm not going to uh, be definitive uh, on anything uh, that, that isn't uh, decided, but what I am going to be definitive on, we are not going to be delisting the shares that people currently own on the AIM market in London. We will continue to have a listing for as long as it makes sense um, on, on both a US exchange and a UK exchange in the event that we do uh, conduct the IPO. So I, I hope that, that uh, that's as clear as it can be, that firstly, there is not a fire and forget um, cost associated with an IPO uh, that we would only move forward, having shortened the runway by having done the preparatory work, which the company needs to do in any case. Um, and secondly, that we are not going to be cancelling shares that are listed on the AIM uh, market. In the end, the market will determine where the liquidity moves to. Right now, it's clear the liquidity is on the AIM uh, market, and, and it would be madness to uh, to be forecasting the end of that. Um, in terms of, uh, uh, there are some questions around uh, Megrez. Um, I'm going to leave those for for uh, later in the, uh, in the in the presentation. Um, uh, in terms of uh, time frame for uh, moving forward with the gas uh, project, um, that is uh, in the hands of AGDC, working with Goldman Sachs and, and potential funding partners. Um, and I think everyone's aware that the Woodmac report was requested by the legislature 
in terms of providing some um, backstop funding to help ensure that the decision on moving forward with front-end engineering design uh, could be made as quickly as possible. Um, the uh, precise timing, though, of, of that process completing, um, I'm not in a position to share uh, anything other than to say that we are engaged in a constructive way with AGDC and the other stakeholders in the project to help ensure that it moves forward as quickly as can be uh, the case. Um, the, uh, the final question I want to address um, uh, uh, now, uh, before we move into uh, uh, Bob and Roger, um, is why should we have confidence in the ability to arrange alternative funding, uh, given that we have been working on this for the best part of a year? Uh, the answer is uh, that we've been uh, working on it for uh, actually somewhat less than, than a year on the basis that there was a lot of preparatory work that had to be done before we could begin that initiative. Um, that we have we took a, an active decision to favor off-taker financing over vendor. You'll remember when we started out, we said there were a number of strands that included vendor financing, off-taker financing, and, and potential mezzanine and other uh, ventures. We chose the one that we think has the best chance of delivering the best uh, outcome for investors. Um, we have other activities ongoing, which we're not going to be providing a running commentary on, but uh, I know that, that the board is uh, aligned and engaged on ensuring that we deliver certainty around our ability to move forward with the underlying development of the Arpoon and Kodiak fields uh, as quickly as possible and, and uh, not, not taking any risks on not having that funded. Um, with that, uh, uh, Bob, um, I'd like to um, turn it over uh, there are some additional details in, in appendices uh, which you can read at your leisure, but let me turn it over, Bob, to you and to, uh, to Roger. Thank you, David. I'm going to move this to the first slide, which you've, which you've already seen. Um, I just, just want to say something before, you know, kind of before we jump into this, uh, this is going to take just a couple of minutes. Uh, you know, I've been thinking about this over the last couple of days, and I, I've been in this project uh, since the very beginning, and it's now 16 years. And I, I think I can honestly say that we are in the best position that this company's ever been in. Um, I'm, I'm talking to a lot of investors who've been either in Pantheon for a long time or Great Bear for a long time. And, you know, we, we you know, as David has presented and Jay's alluded to in, in the beginning of this, we, we now have certified reserves by the largest, some of the most prestigious auditing for firms in the world. And some of these resources are not only certified, but they are valued. And I've, noticed over the last month or so having conversations with people that they do not understand that these these different groups independent experts have actually given us a value for some of these resources and i just you know this should give confidence to people um, and our shareholders you know on the value of our company you know we're about ready to embark on this this well, uh, Megrez, um, as I stated, it's it's a you know world class uh, exploration pro project, and and we don't we're only doing it because it enhances all of our you know our you know attempts to get the Apun field onto development. It's clustered. These are a cluster of resources that are around the Dalton Highway. And, you know, Megrez or Apun East is part of that project. It's, you know, we're testing 600 million barrels, very low geologic risk. We're looking at a very high quality reservoir. As stated, this is the best reservoir we're going to be testing. Roger's going to be spending time. Uh, you know, explaining that, how we, how we get there. And we are drawing this along the Dalton Highway. And on this, the, 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 the object of the first well 
obviously to find light hydrocarbons, but also maximize the amount of data that we're, we're going to co collect. So, you know, we've had this slide up a couple of times in the past. I'm not going to talk in detail of it, but, you know, I will say one thing. It does show we have found a lot of hydrocarbons already in the Kodiak field. Uh, we found a lot in the uh, Apoon top sets in the West. Uh, we're drilling up there to the, you know, shallower, the next set of top sets, which are Megrez. Um, and I just want to say something about the, the amount of hydrocarbons we've already found, the 2.5 billion barrels of hydrocarbons we've already found, found, uh, explored for, and found. Uh, so I'm pretty proud of the team, everybody, the geologists and the engineers who've been, who've who've done this work and we're moving over and we're testing Megrez, which is again, shallower, just the next set of top sets, younger and really, really excellent reservoir. Um, I'm not gonna talk in detail off of these two slides. I'm gonna, after I, you know, in a few minutes, uh, I'm gonna turn it over to Roger and he's gonna explain to you what these mean, but for the geoscientists and the people who are who are knowledgeable um, and we're, we're looking at it the the slide on the left um, the, the color displays with the you know particularly uh, you, you see where the well uh, the well plan is what we're where we're targeting and what we've already hit at Apoon uh, West in the top set over there the reds and the yellows where we're drilling are telling us we're, we're going into some pretty good reservoir. And when you look at the next slide of the, on, the, on the right there, which is another uh, amplitude display of the, uh, uh, using what we call the AVO display, you see all these greens, that is telling you something. You can keep these, two, when we're drilling the well, you should have these two slides just kind of looking and saying, you know, this is, you know, the expectation from these two, the, the, these data is we're going to be hitting some very, very, very good reservoir. And just, just as a point of interest, and we brought it up in the past and at other webinars and other talks, we have intersected this reservoir already, but there have not been intersected where we see a trap geometry for hydrocarbons. So if you look at the line on the left, at pipeline state above the Apoon top set, we have sidewall cores that are telling us that already hard data that this is good reservoir, 20 to 25% porosity. And in one of the sidewall cores, 35% permeability, significantly better, significantly better than anything that we've intersected, but importantly, tested over at Alcade 2. I think with that, I'm going to turn it over to Roger because he's going to explain all this. And I, I think that's what most people are waiting for. So Roger, over to you. All right. Thanks, Bob. I'm going to first explain what AVO is, amplitude variations with offset. And then when you're all experts at AVO, we're going to go exploring. Seismic data shot. It's shot with lots of sources and lots of receivers. This results in some ray paths going vertically and also some ray paths that are at angles. The ray path that goes vertically samples the physics. It, it samples the rock in terms of its compressibility and its density. Whereas the ray paths going at an angle, they sample the rock in terms of compressibility, density, and shearability. So we have, the physics are different. We have two different sets of what's going on here. In fact, we can actually take one seismic survey and turn it into two different volumes of information so we can play one off the other. You know, it's not all that different from when you're on the medical industry, when you get an MRI and you get a CT scan. Sometimes you need one, sometimes you need the other. Sometimes you need a combination of the two to be able to assess what's going on. When uh, 
when we're using these two different data sets to understand our rocks, you can understand how a shale is very layered. Therefore, it will be very shearable compared to a sand that is not layered. In terms of fluids, water is not compressible. The oil with gas in it is compressible. Gas is very compressible. So these two different data sets, if you want to call them that, these two different volumes can give us a lot of insight into what's going on in the rocks. But the, we have to learn what it is when we compare one data set to the other data set, what is it we're really looking for? So what we do is we cross plot the two data sets. The two important things about the cross plot are firstly, how far do the points move from the origin? And secondly, which direction do the points go? So every point in the data set falls somewhere in, these, in this cross plot space. On the cross plot on the left, you'll see where the arrows emanate from. That's point zero, zero. That's when the data sees nothing. And then when the seismic state starts to see something, the point will move in some distance and some direction. The distance it moves is very important because that's a very much a function of lithology. It's a function of fluids. It's a function of thickness. And the direction it goes, which is also called aviotype, gives us a lot of insight into what the rock properties are, whether it's more porous, where it's laminated or blocky. Uh, it often can help infer depositional facies. So it's a very interesting uh, data set to have, especially when you have the two to work together. Discoveries we've made already, the current Apun top sets and the Kodiak basin floor fan fall in the area circled there. These sands are harder than the shales. That's why they fall in the direction that they do. That means if the sands are falling that direction, the shales fall in the opposite direction. Now we're going to change and go to the Megrez play. Megrez is younger, it's shallower, it's more porous. The sands are certainly going to be softer than the shales rather than harder than the shales. So the whole AVO story flips and turns the other direction. So the circles that you see now are where the Megrez sands will fall. It's not much of a speculation. That is where they'll be. In fact, these, this, these zones encircled there are where the sands fall for horseshoe and pika and willow and alpine. That's where the alpine field falls. And within those zones, we're looking for the bright, on the left volume, the distance from the origin, we're looking for the points to get to red. That would signify that they were anomalous. And on the right side, we're looking for the areas where it says three, two, and one. Those are the aviotypes of three, two, and one. Those are going to be the best rocks. And within those best rocks, the aviotype three, they're going to be the best of the best. So now that you're all experts on AVO, let's go exploring. To set the scene. We're going to look in the area of where Ed Duncan has previously talked about how the, we have these two shelf margins prograding, and the confluence of those two has created this, this area that we call the funnel, or all, all the explorers in Alaska call the funnel. Ed Duncan calls it the super trap. So we're going to look at this arbitrary line. Starting on the west side of that arbitrary line is where the Talitha well is. Continuing down the arbitrary line, we go to Pipeline State. Yes, sir, Bob? Before we do this, yeah, before we do this, I want to make a point when, you know, that when uh, Roger just blithely passed through when he said Alpine, um, I, 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 you know, he's, he's very modest. Alpine is a billion barrel oil discovery on the North Slope, and it's the last truly known billion barrel oil discovery on the North Slope. It's producing. Uh, Roger is, you know, one of the people attributed to making that 
discovery uh, using these techniques. So I just thought I would just po point that out again. Sorry. So he just kind of he kind of jumped over Alpine there. I thought I would just chuck that in. Go ahead, Rob. Oh, Bob, thanks. <laughs> So the arbitrary line goes from Talitha to pipeline state, then to the end of the shelf margin. Then we're going to jump across the funnel or super trap to the shelf margin on the other side. To continue setting the scene, the HRZ, the high radioactive zone, as it's called, that's our prolific hydrocarbon source. Right here on the left, I'm um, enhancing what the Talitha well looks like. The first track in that Talitha well shows the lithology, the sands green. I'm, I mean, the sands are yellow, the shales are green. And the second track is a blow up of the porosity. The green in that porosity is oil. And as you can see, it's filled with oil from the HRZ all the way up to the seal. Every sand is filled with oil. That's billions of barrels of oil in place. Just a testament to what a tremendous hydrocarbon source we're sitting on top of. This is the area we're going to explore today. This is the funnel area. So what we're looking for in terms of AVO is large distances from the origin, meaning in this, it's anomalous. In other words, we're looking for the reds as shown in the cross plot and the seismic section. This is a the seismic section of that cross plot. So the color bar the, on the cross plot is the same color bar that's used in the seismic section. So we're looking to see where the reds are. And the first thing you'll notice is, well, there's a whole bunch of reds there. That's a very anomalous horizon. Something's causing that to happen. So we're gonna click on it and see what it, how it maps out. So the map on the left, is showing what that what the contiguous body looks like that the computer has pulled out. But the color of that map on the left is the color of AVO types shown in the cross plot just below it. The greens are type three, the reds are twos, and then there's some very light reds that are ones. Greens are the best. That's the best of the best. But what's even more impressive is that this map does not contain type fours and fives. I often see when I'm using AVO to explore, which is what I do every day, when you have a map that is threes, fours, and fives, it tends to not work. When you have an anomaly that's ones, twos, and threes, it tends to work a very high percentage of the time. In other words, there's a difference between a type three and a type three. A type three that has neighbors of fours and fives is something else probably. When a type three has neighbors of ones and twos, those are the ones that work. So continuing down, we pick the next horizon, another map, ones, twos, and threes. Perfect, it doesn't get better than this. The next one below it, there's another one, ones, twos, and threes again. And the next one, ones, twos, and threes. You put them all together, you see how nicely it all falls together in that trap. This is a spectacular set of stacked anomalies. What could possibly be causing this? These are just anomalies. But I'm a great believer in Occam's razor. You see Occam's razor playing out over and over again. In my words, Occam's razor states that the simplest solution to explain a set of circumstances is likely the correct one. Simple, that's what works. So here we are with, with, this, with these prospects sitting on top of a prolific hydrocarbon source that has put billions of barrels into the rocks above it. We have a trap that's set up above it that's caused by the funnel. We have numerous, not just one, we have numerous AVO anomalies with AVO signatures that are the type that work. How do we best explain what's going on? 
It's not one, it's multiple. And these anomalies are consistent with what's found that horseshoe, pika, willow, and of course, alpine. Uh, alpine. My opinion is that the simplest way to explain all this is that we are sitting on, on a trap that is another elephant. We have a new elephant by the tail here. When you look at the uh, management uh, explanation or prediction of 609 million barrels and 3.3 TCF of gas, that is from three of these horizons. Pantheon has mapped nine horizons in this, and we're just talking about three. This is really, really exciting stuff. It, it's, it, it's tremendous. And the simplest way, always remember that, the simplest way to explain something is the one that's right. You want to say something, Bob? Go ahead. Like, yeah, I want to point out that, you know, Roger and using Roger's technique in the tighter rock, we've already found again 1.6 billion barrels. This this stuff is the classic seismic attribute work that you use around the world for looking for conventional good reservoirs with hydrocarbons in it. And that's what we're seeing here at Megrez at the you know at the Megrez location. We're going to hit a number of zones and you know we're going to test out the idea uh you know i'll turn it over to uh, I, I think David. Yeah. so so there are no there are no specific questions relating to the technical case but i i there are a couple that that i know people uh, brought uh, beforehand um the first is um can we reach all of uh, uh of the nine horizons that we've mapped from the um uh, the, the west no. of the river. No, the the answer to that is is no. Um, the but and I want to point out that because of the nature of the trap that we're testing, which is actually a structural trap, there's a big structural nose that's associated with it and a fault that gives us some of the trap. We have the ability to test several zones stacked on each other. If this was just purely, purely, purely a stratigraphic trap, just a simple, very simple stratigraphic trap, that we, we that could be a difficult situation. It's not uh, the normal situation, but we do have the ability to test probably three zones. But uh, David, ultimately, with a larger rig, we can, and I haven't looked at every one of those, but we can we can reach the majority of them with a larger rig. Oh, we can reach a lot longer rigs, you know, to get yeah. uh, well, to that, get that, that, the I think, Yeah, I think that's what the question was getting at. You know, I, I, I recall um, when we were determining how far to lease across the river, it, we, it was based yeah. on what could we uh, reach uh, from a development perspective, recognizing that that the development wells are, are slightly more complex than, than just a simple uh, 45 yeah. degree uh, uh, exploration. Yeah. And looking at that, we thought we could get to the extreme Eastern edge. And, and if we got to, to within that edge, we'd probably drain all of those, all of those uh, sands outside the marginally outside yeah. that edge. Yeah. 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 Um, and the second question is slightly, um, you know, it, it fits into the, uh, uh, the talking about it stage, and, uh, and and if we if we've got a success at Magres, um, I, I think my my guess is that the hardest thing in the world is going to be to keep Bob quiet, um, rather than that we're going to be uh, uh, reticent about uh, promoting it. Um, we've we've over the course of the last uh, twelve months, we've we've definitely encouraged in, into the industry discussion. Uh, there have been a number of papers related to. Uh, our rocks that have been presented at, at various conferences and stuff, that, that activity will, will clearly step up. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, in general, um, the, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of engagement that uh, Jay and Bob and I and, and other members of the team are having with, uh, with industry. Um, I, I, I suppose it, it shouldn't come as a surprise that a lot of those discussions don't happen in public, they happen uh, uh, privately. Um, the, 
but there is uh, there's certainly no shortage of, of making sure that the relevant uh, people are aware um, and, and introducing a, a broader community of people to it. Um, I think we, the, the maybe there are, there are a few more questions that, that are sort of more specific. They relate to IPO process and that kind of thing. Um, we'll, we'll address that in, in the written answers that we'll eventually post. Um, there's, there are two uh, outstanding questions, though, that I, I think we should answer. Um, the first is, uh, it looks like we've got no drilling timetables for 2025. Um, and and I'll, I'll kick off, but Jay, I know you, you may want to say a bit more. Um, clearly, the drilling window outside of using gravel pads is, is winter. And so, uh, you know, any drilling that we haven't got currently funded is subject to funding. Um, in the event that we were to be drilling further, um, appraisal of Megres, for example, um, uh, that, that could happen any time during 2025, um, subject to funding. Yeah. But in terms of the other wells, they would all uh, require um, ice, ice pads. Jay, do you want to talk a little bit about, about you know, how, how quickly we could get that together? Well, yes, we, we certainly could uh, get together drilling for the winter of 2025-2026. And, you know, as, as David just said, that we, that would be either Talitha B or uh, follow-up wells at Theta West, uh, or possibly if we had the funding, both of those, and um, ha have a nice road that goes to uh, a Talitha B pad and on out to the Updip Theta West. So uh, that, that could certainly work subject to funding, and those would be pretty exciting wells. Obviously, can I, uh, go can ahead, I make Paul. a comment? One of the things that I think that people take take for granted is in what they should understand is with Megrez, we're again drilling off a gravel pad, which means that we are and we're collecting whole core sidewall core data, and and we're getting that data. You know, and I fully believe we're going to make a discovery, and and once we do, let's we we vlog the well, we release the rig, and there will be a period of time, a short period of time, in which we will analyze that core data, and as David has said, to make our decisions on how we're going to test the well. But we will go out and test the well, probably early in the winter. So you know, kind of in December, we've collected the data. I've, Ed Duncan has already talked to the different labs to expedite the, the, the data such that we can make decisions on how we're going to test the well. Up in Alaska, that's not the normal process. In Alaska, you have a winter, you drill a winter well, you go out, you collect your data. Next winter, you come out and test it. So we have the, advantage, the advantage of actually as a continuous process with short breaks to test the well and maybe even later in the year, you know, with the pad, maybe even do a slightly longer test uh, production test. So we will have a continuous process of evaluation and testing of this, of this well, if it's successful for, for many people that could be a drill season, and then a test season, and then another test season, particularly if you have multiple tests and you want to do it for more than 15 minutes or a day. So it, it, it's a, we have the ability to expedite that process. So that is going to be, that's the way I see it over the next 12 months, just on Megrez. I mean, it's a fantastic thing that we, again, have the gravel pad and are going to have the ability to do that. And, and if we if we wanted to drill an additional well to to probe other parts of, of it, um, it we'd, we'd have that flexibility. So it would be it's, oh. it, it's simply we didn't want to uh, put put down plans that we didn't have funded, uh, but but actually because of the gravel pad, we have have the opportunity uh, uh, for for activity throughout um, next year in, in a variety of different ways. Uh, Jay, there's a question about um, timing for completion of the pad, mobilization, um, expected spud. What do you want to... Uh... Yeah, so as David said earlier, the pad is actually more than 50% complete. 
Uh, we've targeted a one November spud. Um, we think that is easily achievable. Um, it would be great to actually spud a little bit before that. Um, we're not promising that, but uh, that would be uh, a, a nice thing to have. It's not a long well. We think the well will be completed by the end of November, there or thereabouts. Uh, and then um, we will have collected our data. We'll turn it over to the experts for analysis. And then once we get that data back, uh, we will have collected some PVT data, lots of logs, cores, sidewall cores. As David says, we will we will analyze that and determine: do we do a small frac, a small acid frac, what, whatever it might be, to complete this deviated well? It's not going to be horizontal. It's not going to be a vertical well, but a deviated well to the so that we get uh, the best completion possible. And if we if we're thinking of in, uh, of intersecting three different zones, um, that, that's why again. You know, in, in ultimately in development, one may well be combining what is the geometry and, and whatever else. So that's that's the reason. Until until we actually see what it is we're intending to test, it's just not possible to uh, to be definitive about um, uh, what what the expectations of the test. Uh, Roger, um, I think it's probably one for you about um, do we can we tell anything about the phase risk in terms of, for example, is there free gas? Uh, are we seeing um, a difference between oil and water, is there a chance that, that it's going to end up like Alcade 2? The, trying to determine, separate gas from oil on seismic turns out to be really quite difficult. It sounds like it should be easy because gas is far more compressible. But if the amplitudes that we have here are really not consistent with it having free gas, Free gasket should get a lot brighter than we're even seeing right now. So no, I I don't see evidence of free gas, even though it's tough. It, it, uh, Bob, can, I, can I add something? Yeah. We, we are we're we're you know in terms of geologic you know distance, we're we're stone throw away where we've tested light oil from the same source rock. It's in the same part of the generation window. It's it's a it's a light. All these things are light oil reservoirs with a certain GOR. Bang! That's what that's the ex expectation. That's what I think. Overwhelming what the seismic attributes are are telling us. Roger's key point is in this reservoir. The what we are looking at, we can now individually. We're seeing the individual reservoir. Something we couldn't see to the west, but we're seeing these stacked individual reservoirs and being able to identify and give a feeling for thickness, get a feel for, and, and what the, you know, what is the fluid type? And, and but it's a, it's a good question. How, how thick um, do we think these, are we, are we looking for 10, 100 or 1,000 foot sands? Okay. So in the geologic environment that we're in, these sands are going to be, somewhere between set each, each individual one will be 75 to let's say 100 and 125 feet thick stacked on top of each other and that's, that's what we're looking at with the, best, with, the, with the best part of the reservoir at the at the top it's you know you, you can look at published stuff at horseshoe and pika it's going to look very similar to that yeah. i'd just like to remind everybody that we're six for six using roger's avo on finding yeah. hydrocarbons um, okay, so so just to, to um, uh, one final thing, and, and maybe I wasn't clear um, uh, earlier. When we're looking at the different um, initiatives, we're not doing this sequentially. We're doing this in parallel. We've got ongoing activity relating to alternatives uh, that, that don't rely upon um, either MEGRES or, or AGDC uh, activity coming good. It's not that we're focus solely on those things, hoping for a good result, and then we'll pick ourselves up and dust ourselves off and, and go to the next plan. Uh, we're, we're running everything in parallel. A number of things 
are not mutually exclusive. If, if we're in a position to monetize the gas, that doesn't mean that we're not um, interested in a strategic transaction with, with a potential partner, um, uh, et cetera. So we, the, the full attention um, uh, of the board is, is on running all these processes in parallel um, along the way. Um, as I say, there, there are some other specific questions that have been uh, asked and, and we will we'll group them together and, and uh, post the, uh, uh, the answers. But I just want to thank everyone for uh, investing the time uh, to, to uh, engage with us. Uh, thank you, Roger and Bob, for, for sharing some of the detailed under the hood uh, science. But to leave you with, with one clear message, which is that we are working together as a team to deliver the cash self-sufficiency from developing the resources we've already found. Um, that nothing is is going to distract us from making sure that happens and anything that we're doing uh, fits clearly into uh, boosting the ability to deliver uh, on that. We will, over the course of uh, the next several months, be providing um, some updates about specific parts of the project, not, not in terms of corporate webinar, um, you know, talking about the company so much as talking about processes, because it's clear that um, uh, investors have concerns, for example, about regulatory, uh, uh, the, the regulatory approval and, and how we get there. They have uh, questions about um, uh, what, what the uh, potential gas market may be. And so we will seek to make sure that we provide uh, the information to help uh, investors to make informed decisions around what level of risk they're, they're comfortable with. But I can tell you that uh, in terms of the Pantheon board, um, we are uh, very comfortable that we have a, a development plan which we've sought external validation, not just of the resource, but also of the development plan from people who developed these things in Alaska before. So project assurance work um, that will uh, uh, be hopefully in a position to, to share and, and bring investors to the same level of understanding uh, of the risks and, and uh, the potential of this uh, as we all have. Uh, from inside the tent. Uh, with that, I'm going to pass you back to Alessandro for a few uh, administrative details. Um, and, and thank you once again for joining us. Thank you, uh, Bob. Thank you, Jay. Uh, thank you, Roger, for, for your time. David, thank you very much for that. And, and thank you all for updating investors today. Could, could I please ask investors not to close the session? As you know, we automatically redirected to provide your feedback in order that the management team can better understand your views and expectations. This will only take a few moments to complete, but I'm sure will be greatly valued by the company. On behalf of the management team of Pantheon Resources PLC, we'd like to thank you for attending today's presentation and good afternoon to you all.